morning. Thanks for coming in for this panel on Latino and Latin American immigration activism. Our first presenter is Richard, Richard Hunter. Dr. Hunter is in the geography department. He's been at SUNY Cotland since 2011. And he's an active member of the Latino and Latin American Studies Committee. His interest in historical geography centers around Latin America. Welcome. Richard. Originally in the spring when I agreed to do a talk, and I picked the title for my talk, I was going to focus mostly on the historical chain migration between certain pueblos in Mexico sending migrants to certain cities in the U.S. So you might have half of a certain pueblo um, that now lives in Chicago, or another half of another pueblo in Mexico living in Orlando. Um, but I thought that would be too much like a lecture on the historical geography of migration. And thinking about the purpose of this conference, Race, Resistance, and Reason, I decided to go light on the historical factors of chain migration and focus more on reason in terms of what we think of now as reason political discourse about immigration from Mexico and how there are racial undertones to our discussion of chain migration today, specifically through the DREAM Act. The roadmap for this talk will be talking about what chain migration is, how it's been manifested in the U.S., Mexican immigrants. When we talk about the DREAM Act, we're talking about children who are here undocumented or arrived as children undocumented, but mostly we are talking about Mexicans. And then we'll talk about chain migration and quotes and amnesty and quotes. So these terms do have specific meanings, but they're being misused for political spin doctrine, for manufacturing political consensus one way or the other. What chain migration is, is just like what it sounds like. One person immigrates from country A to country B, establishes a household, um, lands employment, accumulates savings, creates a social network with other immigrants from the same country, and makes it easier for immigrants to come. They establish what you might think of as a beachhead. They start to establish ethnic neighborhoods. We end up with Chinatowns, Little Italys. We end up with ethnic newspapers printed in whatever language is dominant in the neighborhood and so on. One of the things I used to like to do in my, early, in my early 20s was genealogy. And if you want to be very lonely, be a young man doing genealogy on the web. Um, because your company on the web then is going to be older women doing genealogy for your grandkids. But for whatever reason, I like to do genealogy. And I found this census form from 1920 in Utica, which is nearby in Oneida County. And my great-grandfather, my mother's grandfather, was from Italy, Salvatore Serechia. It says he's from Italy, his mother tongue is Italian, and his father was Italian and spoke Italian, and his mother was Italian and spoke Italian. And what we see here in the census form for the block is that the entire block is Italian. This is chain migration. He was a boarder living in a border house with other men. By 1930, his wife, Maria, had come over. She came over in 1924, and they started to have a family. So Salvatore came first, and then his wife joined him some years later once he got out of the boarding house and established his own household. I see chain migration in my own family history. And this has been repeated millions of times for many countries around the world, for many people who have not been here for a couple of generations, like myself. Almost by definition, it's hard to get a clear number of how many undocumented migrants there are in the US, because they tend to live in the shadows. They tend to try not to be counted or not be noticed in any official sense. Some countries, like Jamaica, suffer from what we call the brain drain. The educated elite, the nurses, the doctors, the lawyers, and so on, are leaving Jamaica to the countries of Western Europe, the US and Canada, to earn more money, have a more prestigious career, and so on. Mexico is suffering from what we might call a brawn drain. It's the physical laborers. It's the people who are landscapers, builders, the people taking care of our children while we're at work, who are the people migrating from Mexico, typically. Most Mexican migrants don't have much formal education, as opposed to migrants from some other country. Now, if a Mexican wants to migrate legally to the US to do whatever kind of work as a laborer, there really is no legal path for this person. US immigration law is such that you can get an H-1B visa, or a working visa, if you have a master's degree in certain fields, like law, science, the STEM fields generally. Or if you have a family member who is in the US, who is a permanent resident, what we think of as a green card holder, or as a citizen, that person can petition for you to come to the United States. But if you don't have a relative already in the US who can petition for your legal entry, and if you don't have 
an advanced degree, which will allow the government to give you a working visa, there's really no legal path for you to go from Mexico to the U.S. to be a landscaper or a gardener or a nanny or so on. And so many Mexicans are here legally as a result. The DREAM Act is an acronym, as so many government names are, to Development and Relief for Alien Education of Alien Minors. This is supposed to benefit children who were brought to the U.S. by no fault of their own by their parents. The children were undocumented. It can benefit people who are now up to age 30. Depending on the version of the legislation we're talking about, which Congress introduced it, or if we're talking about a Senate version or a House version, typically varies between 29 and 35. They have to be below that age. In the U.S. for five years, no serious criminal history. There's no path towards legality for a minor, if that minor has committed a felony or is under deportation proceedings as we speak. And they have to complete two years of college, not necessarily earn a degree, but they have to have two years towards a bachelor's or serve two years in the military. A critique of this is, is seen as a military recruitment tool. And if a person qualifies for the DREAM Act and pays the application fee, they can have a conditional permanent residence, residency for five years, during which time they can fulfill the requirements of college or military, and if they still have a clean criminal record, they can reapply for another five years of conditional permanent residency. So after a total of 10 years, they can become permanent residents, what we think of as green card holders. Marco Rubio has been using the term chain migration during the past year to talk about the deficit or the main problem he sees in the DREAM Act. Marco Rubio, Marco Rubio is a junior senator from Florida. What Marco Rubio says is, for example, provides for chain migration, which I think is the biggest problem that it creates. So you're not only helping the kids, but once a kid becomes a citizen or a legal resident and then a citizen, they can now act as an anchor to bring in their entire family through the process. And that means that the DREAM Act is not limited to kids, my emphasis. It could be expanded to millions of people, which is problematic. He's saying that um, if a child becomes a citizen or a permanent resident, you're not only allowing two million children to have a legal path towards citizenship and legality and all the benefits that come there with, but also their parents and their step-uncles and their brothers and sisters. Um, so he's saying that perhaps there might be four more immigrants for every dreamer that is allowed in the country. And he's saying, so instead of two million, we might have eight million or 10 million people come in. He sees this as a backdoor amnesty. The irony is that Marco Rubio's father petitioned to come to the U.S. from Canada in 1956 because his sister-in-law petitioned for him to allow him to do so. So Marco Rubio is in the U.S. because of chain migration of the exact sort he is now inveighing against for Mexicans uh, through the DREAM Act. But is chain migration really something we have to worry about through the DREAM Act? Um, first of all, I don't think it is anything that we need to be morally or economically or politically against in its own right. But even if we did have some irrational fear of chain migration of Me from Mexico to the U.S., it's probably a fear that's unfounded because, one, many of the dreamers probably already have a relative who is a legal permanent resident or a citizen who can already petition for the dreamer's family to come in. Secondly, um, they already have their families with them. These children already have their mother and their father in the U.S. They probably already have their siblings in the U.S. There aren't that many more people for them to petition because you can't petition for an aunt and an uncle. There is no legal pathway to bring them in. If you are a permanent resident, you can petition for your spouse and your child. Once you gain citizenship, you can apply for your spouse, your child, and then your parents. That's it. No aunties, no uncles, no grandparents. So these immediate family members, as the U.S. government defines them, are probably already in the U.S. If the dreamer's parents are in the U.S. illegally, the DREAM Act requires those parents to return to their own country for 10 years before they can be brought in legally. So there are these mechanisms built into the DREAM Act to prevent any sort of immediate massive chain migration, if, if there even is such a worry about that. Representative Lamar Smith from Texas is the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, so a mainstream voice in the Republican Party and an important voice in the Republican Party on matters of judicial importance. What he says is that while DREAM Act supporters claim that it would only benefit children, they skip over the fact that it actually rewards the very illegal immigrant parents who knowingly violated our laws. Once their children become U.S. citizens, they can petition for their legal immigrant parents and adult siblings to be legalized who will then bring in others in an endless chain. Again, he's talking about chain migration. 
there are mechanisms, again, in the DREAM Act that prevent people from immediately applying or petitioning the government to bring over relatives. It's a minimum of at least 10 years. You need to have conditional residency for two five-year terms before you become a permanent resident. And only then can you apply for your children or your spouse. Now, since we're talking about dreamers who are brought to the U.S. as children, they probably don't have a spouse in another country. They probably don't have children in another country. So this is something we really need to worry about. The right-leaning Conservative Heritage Foundation weighed in on the DREAM Act. They say DREAM should really stand for deviously replacing enforcement with amnesty, D-R-E-A-M, since it will basically extend amnesty to an estimated 2.1 million illegal aliens who are as old as 35 or 30. So they're saying the DREAM Act is supposed to benefit children, but we're talking about middle-aged adults here. However, these are adults who are suffering now because they were brought to the U.S. as small children. That seems to be overlooked. So they are adult victims in this sense. This law will provide amnesty, my emphasis, to large numbers of individuals who are in the United States illegally and allow chain migration of even more. So he's also misusing chain migration, which so many of us in this room are in the U.S. because of. But he's also using the word amnesty in a politically charged way. And we can talk about that. First, to give amnesty or clemency vacates a legal charge. It's understood under common law that children, especially children under 10, are incapable of having the mental capacity to commit a crime with intent, consciously. Children simply can't be charged with crimes if they're that young. So they, they don't need amnesty for anything because they haven't committed anything illegal. We tend to think of children as being here undocumented, not illegally. But again, Lamar Smith is seeing this as a backdoor amnesty for parents. How does this trickle down into the larger conversation about immigration through the DREAM Act? Um, we see imagery on the web. Be a patriot, hell no to amnesty. If there's amnesty through the DREAM Act, we're going to have these hordes of people running across the border. In conclusion, thinking about um, Marco Rubio, who's trying to slam the door of chain migration after his family got in to the United States through chain migration from Cuba, it smacks of an I've got mind jack attitude. I'm here, I'm successful, nobody else should be allowed to enter. And when we talk about Millions of people coming through chain migration. It sounds like these endless hordes of unwashed masses who are going to overtake us. It's as if Mexico and Mexicans are the barbarians at the gate, and the DREAM Act will allow them in. And we're talking about a them in an anthropological sense, and an us. In an endless chain, says Lamar Smith, as if Mexico is going to empty out, the countryside is going to become depopulated as everyone streams to the U.S. I'll close with a poem by Emma Lazarus that she wrote in 1883 for the commemoration of the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these the homeless, tempest tossed me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I think the DREAM Act um, supports these words explicitly and the American ideal that we are a country built by immigrants. And this isn't comprehensive immigration reform. As President Obama says, this is merely a down payment a comprehensive immigration reform. But even this small step is becoming manipulated with geographic terms like chain migration in a way that I think is inappropriate and unhelpful. Thank you. Thank you. She's an associate professor in the history department here at SUNY Cotland, and she joined the faculty back in fall of 2002. She's also the coordinator of Latino and Latin American Studies program, and her history centers on 20th century labor and civil rights activism. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who's joining us at this session. I have to say my head is about ready to explode thinking about Rick's presentation and our excellent keynote address, and so it's going to be really hard to try to limit my um, remarks. But um, in planning this panel, we sought an interdisciplinary perspective. And so I'm going to try to provide, I'm going to backtrack a little bit from what Rick just presented on and provide um, hopefully some historical perspective. Um, can't cover everything, so it'll be somewhat selective and hopefully not too sketchy. But there are some themes that you'll see picked up in some of our other uh, talks. So um, beginning with the issue of migration, 
and in this talk, for the purposes of time, I'll focus mainly on Mexican migration issues to the U.S. since that's what many of my colleagues are doing. Um, we need to keep in mind this most important migration, and that is the migration of the U.S.-Mexican border through w the war with Mexico in um, 1846 to 1848. Um, this war was precipitated by a flood of illegal aliens coming into Texas in violation of Mexico's immigration law, and also instigated by an expansionist president who was carrying out the uh, agenda of manifest destiny, the idea that God had ordained the United States to expand and bring its civilizing influence into areas. And if we think about it, I, I've, I've just been reading lots of lesson plans for social studies, including some that <coughs> talked about Western expansion into these empty areas with no resources and people couldn't live there. And there was an you know, a, there were huge uh, centers of Spanish descent, Mexican descent culture and, and um, civilization in these so-called vacant lands. So this is really important to remember. Um, with respect to the outcome of the war, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo gave half of Mexico to the United States. And this territorial transfer not only brought really important resources to the U.S., um, agricultural lands, mineral resources, not the limited resources I read about in, my lesson, in that lesson plan, but also um, a connection to the Trans-Pacific. Um, it, it, it helped turn the United States and the U.S. West into the Trans-Pacific West, um, open, opening opportunities for future economic expansion to Asia, as well as along other parts of the Pacific Rim. So this migration was really crucial in terms of U.S. development. Um, it also helped to develop a borderlands area that would further integrate the two countries of Mexico and the United States. And we want to think about the fact that there you know, was a, a great deal of fluidity and interaction and, a great, and integration, as well as conflict and uh, discrimination in this area. But um, the historical antecedents of today's debates about Mexican invasions and immigration begin with the U.S. invasion of Mexico and this an important territorial transfer. Um, even though that half of Mexico's land was ceded to the United States, that was only a tenth of Mexico's population in this area. Um, but it did lay the foundation for important chain migration because you had supportive communities to which later um, migrants could travel. And I think one of the issues that will come up in some of the other presentations is the role of labor in migration. I mean, we heard a little bit from Rick about, you know, currently immigration restrictions make it hard for um, Mexicans to come to the United States if they don't have advanced degrees and skills. But um, we need to see Mexican immigration to the U.S. And I sort of hedge about immigration because you might want to take the IM off if you think about migration meaning these, you know, the Mexican-U.S. Connect borderlands connection raises some questions about um, uh, who's, you know, about the separation of those two countries. They're really integrated after, after 1848 and increasingly more so. But in any case, um, Mexican <laughs> descent workers are among those who help build um, an industrial U.S. Uh, and the U.S. West is a very important part of that. Uh, another thing that's traditionally erased from many uh, histories is the fact that it's a very multicultural West with um, people of uh, African descent, Asian descent, um, people coming up from Latin America. And um, again, a lot of the immigration history that's taught in schools tends to focus on European immigration. No, um, you know, not that that's not important, but there's this, um, this crucial phenomenon in the U.S. West and Mexican workers are often recruited for key economic sectors. So they're not just working in agriculture, they're building railroads, other important infrastructure, and importantly, toward in the late um, 1800s, starting in, um, I believe it's 1882, we see restrictive immigration legislation with Chinese exclusion acts. So when the door is shut to Asian immigrants, and then in the early 20th century to certain groups of European immigrants, um, Mexicans and other Latin Americans, but again, I'm going to focus a little more on Mexicans, 
are um, able to come into the U.S. Not that they're not also stopped at the border. In 1924, at the same time that there's an Immigration Act that um, uh, establishes restrictions on, on other immigrants, including Asian and European, um, this is the year that the Border Patrol is instituted. And um, in the early part of the 20th century, maybe 60,000 uh, 60, Mexicans were coming in annually, some of them working seasonally. Um, in the years 1928 to 1929, that was reduced by 75% because of interceptions at the border. I wanted to point out one of the pictures that I have here is a um, picnic uh, organized by LULAC, which was one of the um, many uh, sort of self-help organizations that uh, people of Mexican descent developed. Um, initially, LULAC emphasized citizenship and was opposed to um, especially undocumented Mexican immigration and has been painted by some critics as more conservative, but they were a very important um, civil rights organization in terms of litigation regarding school segregation, and they're around to this day and have changed their um, stance on immigration in part because of some of the persecutions that occurred um, mid-century. So, just as Mexican labor was recruited in the 1920s, um, we might think of a revolving door operating for Mexican immigrant workers, similarly to um, what we can see in other historical cases. The guest workers are desired, they come in, and then when there's an economic downturn, they become scapegoats. And this is something that um, was dramatically illustrated during the Great Depression with um, uh, uh, pressure in local communities, states, and eventually uh, um, uh, federal efforts to repatriate Mexicans. And there was some cooperation with the Mexican government because it's a complicated story, but during the Depression, Mexicans were often the first to be unemployed, denied relief. If they might have been eligible for relief, the idea was, oh, Mexicans get, get by on less, their diet is different. So there, Many Mexicans were facing economic hardship, and the Mexican government at the time did cooperate in trying to repatriate some. But it must be said that another part of U.S. policy was to create a, basically a climate of terror through raids and incarcerations. Um, and so um, we could see this as an early example of um, trying to promote self-deportation by creating a very, very um, unfriendly environment for the Mexican um, descent population. And another thing that's important about this period of repatriation, and the numbers are really hard to pin down, you'll see a variety of, ex uh, of um, estimates, but um, a good percentage of the people who were repatriated forcibly or somewhat voluntarily were U.S. born. There were sweeps that, you know, scooped up anybody who seemed a likely suspect. And I, and I think the historical resonance of this period is something that is shaping a lot of activism today about draconian uh, immigration laws, including in, in uh, Arizona. We don't have time to get into the discussions of race that were so eloquently raised earlier, but the issue is that for people of Mexican descent in the United States, even if race is a social construct, they experienced racial discrimination. And you can see some of this language of, you know, we need to get these folks out because of their undesirable social and racial qualities. Um, and that is, uh, you know, an important historical antecedent for what we see today as well. Um, as a good illustration of that revolving door, bring the workers back in during the Second World War because we need uh, labor to replace um, U.S. workers who have gone to the war front or elsewhere. Um, there were also opportunities for Mexican Americans who may have been second or third generation or even longer time residents to move into new sectors of the economy, as you see by these women railway workers during the Second World War, Rosita's, Rosita's if you will. Um, and the uh, U.S. and Mexican governments uh, uh, negotiated a guest worker program called the Bracero Program, which, as you notice, was extended long after the Second World War because of the pressure of employers. So we, here we have this illustration of the um, somewhat recognized demand for labor. Um, it should be added that some of the opponents at the, of the Bracero Program 
um, included uh, Mexican uh, American unionists because this program, um, which increasingly offered fewer and fewer protections for the guest workers, um, jeopardized the ability of unions and others to gain better wages and conditions for longer resident workers. Then here's the part that I really have to contain myself because this is one of my research specialties, but um, I, I am excited by the idea of activists at many, many different points in history challenging these structures of inequality. And in the 1930s and 40s, there was considerable labor and civil rights activism um, among Latino populations, a lot of Mexican descent uh, participants in the organizations that I looked at. We could certainly see this as part of a more global phenomenon with the rise of the left and unions, many of them challenging white supremacy um, in this time period. And there was certainly plenty of white supremacy to challenge, as you can see by some of these signs from uh, California restaurants here. But central players in this activism included labor unions, left-wing groups, including the US Communist Party, and they had allies with the Mexican Communist Party. Um, but they weren't the only, you know, the only or the majority activists in these struggles. But the fact that you had some leftists involved in them did mean that organizations working on labor and civil rights in this period were targeted for repression. And I think this is a really important point. Um, a longer story, but these activists could have made a real difference in the future of US and, and Mexico. And thank you. And um, they were the ones who were, sh who were shut down. Um, there's a variety of mechanisms and uh, legislation used to contain the influence of these activists. So many of the sort of un-American activities, acts that were passed during the McCarthy period alluded to earlier, anthropologists suffered, academics, and um, many of the people who were involved in this labor and civil rights organizing. Um, there were uh, immigrant rights groups like Committees for the Protection of the Foreign Born who tried to assist um, individual activists who were targeted, and they themselves became the targets of investigation and persecution. The important thing that I want to end on is that the activism continues, so it's taken a variety of forms, but so do nativist currents and immigration debates. And this is really trying to set us up for our next presenter, um, who will do more of the contemporary immigration activism. But um, I'm Obviously, there's a resurgence of Mexican-American activism in the 1960s. Um, some of the veterans of the earlier movements are part of that. Uh, we see also some important challenges to uh, new immigration laws uh, and the enforcement of existing immigration laws. One immigration act that I, that's important to mention is the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act because in addition to um, setting caps rather than quotas for immigration from certain areas. It also included a, um, an updating of the language about refugees. But again, to be a refugee under these terms, you had to be fleeing a communist do or communist dominated company, uh, country or a natural disaster, which shut the door to refugees from repressive anti-communist regimes that the United States was, rep was supporting. Um, we saw in the 1980s activists basically violating immigration law to support refugees from these countries. And I find it really interesting um, that the name of this earlier sanctuary movement, helping Central American refugees in that time period, now we're starting to see the new sanctuary movement recognizing a new wave of persecution of, um, of immigrants from Latin America. And um, we may in questions uh, get to return to Proposition 187 in California, which aimed at denying public services to undocumented immigrants. But as this graphic from one of their brochures illustrates, there's a highly political agenda in um, trying to disempower and discourage these uh, immigrants from coming in as well. Thank you. She's in the history department also, and she's been at SUNY Cotland since. 
she's active in the Latin American um, Studies and Latino, Latino and Latin American Studies Committee. And her research interest is in human, international, human rights? Indigenous rights, immigrant rights. Indigenous rights, right, immigrant rights, as well as um, she is a very strong advocate in our Amnesty International, as well as the New York Immigration Coalition. Please welcome Dr. Uta. Thank you. I'm going to take a look at what's going on in the country. I'm going to give you a lay of the land of uh, what's going on. Uh, and then also talk uh, briefly about uh, activist responses. So uh, just looking at the Obama administration in 2009, Obama promised to work on comprehensive immigration reform. And as he was articulating that, he said, well, OK, we need uh, a pathway to legal status, but uh, we, we cannot have people coming here and breaking the law. So undocumented immigrants should pay a penalty, pay taxes, learn English and go to the back of the line, which is a really stupid statement, because they, there really is no back of the line. But um, he also stressed plans on, on strengthening border security uh, and also addressing issues of labor exploitation. Uh, and, and really, where we've made most of the headway is the, the border security part, right? And that was intended to bring the Republicans along and to make it more palpable for them to support comprehensive immigration reform. In terms of legislation, that's been a big failure. Congress has failed to pass comprehensive, uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Congress has failed to pass the DREAM Act. Uh, so basically, it left the president uh, only one option, kind of the tail end of his term, uh, to enact uh, DACA deferred action for childhood arrivals, which affects a very small percentage uh, of people. Uh, but in the very least, it uh, it may force the Congress an issue so that Congress actually has to decide what to do now with these people. Uh, at the same time, in recent years, we have anti-immigrant laws, most famously Arizona SB 1070, but also in other states. Uh, some of these are being challenged. They're being challenged uh, by the State Department, by various courts, all the way up to the Supreme Court, and also by organizations such as the ACLU, uh, which has repeatedly uh, asserted racial profiling when it comes uh, to enforcement. In 2010 alone, over 1,000 anti-immigrant ordinances have been passed around the country. So what I'm really hoping people uh, will come away with here is that the climate in this country is extremely polarized. You do have advocates for immigration reform, but then you also really have people on the extreme right engaging in tremendous hate rhetoric uh, and, and also uh, disseminating a, l a lot of misinformation right, about what, what really the, the basic facts are. Um, so again, Border Patrol, that's actually where the President has fulfilled his promise. Uh, as of last year, we've built 650 miles on the southern border with Mexico, and the cost of that border fence in the San Diego sector alone is $21 million per mile. Okay. Um, the cost, the estimated cost, these estimates keep being adjusted upward. Mm -hmm. The estimated cost to uh, finish, and this is just the, the border with Mexico, right? We're not even talking about Canada, which is a border significantly longer, incidentally. But uh, just on the Mexican border, uh, projected cost $22 billion, but that's just to build it, right? To actually operate and maintain it. We're not even talking about staffing it, right? We're looking at another $6.5 billion over the next 20 years. Uh, again, securing the border uh, was supposed to answer to Republican critiques. They said, we're not going to come to the table to negotiate until this border problem is solved, until we're you know, protecting us from these hordes of brown people coming across, basically. Uh, the bottom line is a lot of emphasis has been put uh, on, on the border and, and building the wall, and we actually have drones flying down there as well. Uh, it has not brought Republicans on the table. So that was really, from my perspective, a, a wasted effort at, at compromise. Right? But in terms of human cost, this is what's been happening. Because the border fence is in many of the urban areas, people have been pushed further and further into the desert. Uh, and even though the total numbers of people crossing has slowed, which is in part related to the economic downturn since 2008, deaths on the border are sharply up. So we're now looking at 
an estimated 300 to 800 per year, meaning on average, you know, one to three people every day die trying to cross the border. And just in Arizona alone, and just last year alone, the 177 human remains were found, and some of these skeletons are in various states of decay. Sometimes we can't even determine whether or not we're looking at a male or female skeleton. Right? So uh, the, the human cost has been a, a tremendous, and uh, it represents the, the, the deaths on the border represents a 30-fold increase in the last 11 years. So under the Obama administration, uh, we've deported more people than during any other presidency. Right? We're deporting people at the rate of 400,000 a year. Every single day, about 34,000 people are in immigrant detention. So under the Obama administration, we have deported a million people. Okay? These people have families. Okay? And one out of five of these people who are deported have U.S. citizen children. Right? Uh, so many of these children are either de, de facto deported with their parents. Right? If, if they're minors, the parents as parents have the right to make the decision to take the children with them. Uh, or they're left behind to be taken care of by family members, friends, or they end up in foster care. Right? So for the foster care system, this has been a, a, a tremendous a strain uh, and, and difficulty. So in essence, every year, you know, if you're deporting 400,000 people a year, this is going to affect over a million people a year. Millions, millions of people have been affected by these deportation policies. Right? Uh, and, and again, uh, the Republicans are constantly screaming, uh, Obama's not done enough, we, you know, we're still being overrun by hordes of brown people. Uh, the truth of the matter is, in, in terms of enforcement and border security, this has been the most aggressive president that we have seen. Right? So uh, uh, here I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. Um, Department of Homeland Security has uh, different branches. We have the U.S. Citizenship and, and Immigration Services, we, which deals with... Um, you know, green cards and, and, and uh, legal status and so on. But uh, we have Customs and Border Patrol, and then we have ICE. They have uh, somewhat different jurisdictions. So Border Patrol, these are the people that uh, are supposed to intercept you as you cross the border or at the airport or whatever. Um, and ICE is if you're in the country, if you've been in the country for longer, right, or if you're deeper in the interior of the country. We have a bunch of tools. The uh, 287G agreements actually deputize the police to do the job of immigration agents. That's what we had in Arizona, mm -hmm. right? And actually, the Justice Department, through their investigation about what's been going on down there with racial profiling, they have revoked their 287G agreement with Arpaio. Um, we also have CAP criminal alien program. If you're already in the system, if you've gotten into trouble uh, at the moment that you are released, let's say, from jail, or that you've served your probation, your information is sent to ICE and you're going to get deported, right? So it's kind of like a double jeopardy. Uh, also, we have Secure Communities Program, known as ESCOM. That means every time, any time you have contact with the police, you're taken down to the station, your fingerprints are taken. They're not only uh, sent to the FBI, but also to ICE, right? They, uh, ICE will put a hold on you if there's a positive match, and then you're going to go into deportation proceedings. The reason why that's problematic is because it has nothing to do with innocence or guilt. This does not happen after you've had your day in court and you've been found guilty. All it, it, it can happen as easily as you being pulled over at the traffic stop and because you are brown or because you have an accent, then taking you down to the station on some kind of suspicion, right? and then as soon as you're down at the station, you, could, you can end up in deportation proceedings. Uh, also with Border Patrol, Border Patrol defines its jurisdiction as 100 air miles from the border. Over 97% of New York State was, is within the jurisdiction of Border Patrol. If you're looking 100 miles from the coast, 100 miles from Lake Ontario, 100 li uh, miles from uh, uh, the St. Lawrence, uh, and in that area which the ACLU has called a de facto constitution-free zone, uh, protections against uh, unlawful uh, search and seizure do not apply, Okay, and in that zone, Customs and Border Patrol can ask anybody for their papers. And that includes us right here. And that's why we've had a lot going on in terms of buses being boarded, uh, trains being boarded, and, and these are not uh, trains and buses going to Toronto, right? They, let's say they're going from New York to Chicago. Uh, here's the ACLU map. As you can see, that 100-mile zone, because a lot of the major cities are in the coast, 
two out of every three people living in this country are in fact in that constitution-free zone. Right? So that's how the, the, the power of the federal government has been uh, expanded. And, and this is uh, from an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education that came out maybe a year or so ago. Routine boarding, right? Uh, Rochester, New York is one of the most aggressive spots in the entire northern border. Uh, they, uh, I think in 2010 it was, they arrested well over 1,000 people, and over 90% of them were from trains and buses, and the vast majority of them had been in the country for more than a year. In other words, it has nothing to do with protecting the border. It has nothing to do with intercepting people as they're coming into the country. Advocacy groups have been active. Uh, Reform Immigration for America in 2010 organized a march. Uh, I think in uh, New York State alone we brought 10,000 people. And these are just the buses that we know, right? These are people we've counted on the buses, not uh, people who also took their cars privately down. Uh, just from New York State alone we had at least 10,000 people down in D.C. Um, uh, probably 200,000 people. It just happened to be on the same day that the health care reform bill was passed in the House, so that's, got, that's what got the media attention. You know, there was relatively little on, on us here demonstrating in D.C. Uh, and again, Obama uh, promised to work on comprehensive immigration reform. Advocacy groups, and we have hundreds of them in New York State, continue to provide uh, individual services to immigrants, and that's not going to stop it regardless of what the political climate is, right, providing legal aid services or providing translation services or, you know, ESL classes. I mean, there's a whole range of support services that advocates uh, provide. Uh, but also, and it, it, that, of course, intensifies as the political climate gets worse, uh, lobbying Congress and the administration. Um, so, so here's a picture from, from the March for America. And, you know, you had these big screens in the back, so you had uh, Luis Gutierrez speaking, you know, one of the, the, the major uh, advocates uh, for uh, immigration reform and for the rights of immigrants. But like I said, there was also a videotape tape message by the president, once again, supposedly, recommitting himself to bringing about immigration reform. In response to pressure from advocates, uh, in 2011, Department of Homeland Security finally announced in the so-called Morton uh, memo, that uh, deportation would be uh, prioritized. There's been a lot of critique because people are kind of swept up in these dragnets, right? You have these raids on the apple orchards, you have the raids on the dairy farms, you have roadblocks uh, in Sodus, New York. Uh, uh, Border Patrol was staking out a, a church because... Uh, um, a service was held in, in, mass was held in Spanish, you know, so there's all kinds of racial profiling going on. The bottom line is, this brings up their numbers, right, and Congress has allocated uh, so much money uh, to DHS, and that just happens to buy us the deportation of 400,000 people a year, right? So, so there is a quota system, even though officially the, the administration denies it, but they have to justify their budget, otherwise in the next round of, uh, you know, a budget allotment, they're not going to get as much funding. There was a lot of criticism that really uh, only the most vulnerable people are swept up, but we're not catching terrorists with these methods. And the purpose of catching terrorists, I mean, that's the raison d'etre of Department of Homeland Security, right? And that's what initially they got their funding from. Uh, so there was this promise to prioritize, you know, just deport uh, dangerous criminals. But so far, administratively, only 1% to 2% of the cases have been closed. And basically what that means is, you know, this was just another empty promise, right? To, to get immigrants excited, to get the, you know, Latino votes placated. In practice, there was really not as much happening as, as what was promised. Uh, racial profiling continues. Um, but uh, be besides advocacy groups working on this, we have uh, a lot of really excellent documentaries that came out um, a few years ago, Abuse the Postville Raid, that deals mostly with uh, Guatemalans working in uh, a meatpacking factory in Postville, Iowa. And at the time, this was still under the previous administration, it was the largest ICE raid ever in U.S. history. It cost over $4 million. Uh, you know, you had like hundreds of uh, ICE agents involved in this, ultimately 280 some um, uh, immigrant workers uh, were detained, arrested, and ultimately deported, right? So to deport like 200 some immigrants 
a price tag of over five million. Uh, also, uh, lost in detention. So you had some uh, uh, PBS documentaries, and some of these actually led uh, to investigations. Uh, for example, a congressional uh, uh, representative sent demanding that the Government Accountability Office investigate the practices of Department of Homeland Security. So there are some good things that, uh, that came out of it. I'm going to send around three reports, Amnesty International, Child Without Justice, about immigrant detention, uh, in hostile terrain, looking at enforcement, and then Justice Derailed, which specifically looks at the boarding of, of trains and buses as it, uh, as it happens here. So these are uh, uh, some of the reports. I think what is important, especially for those of you who want to become teachers, is to understand that statistically, right, and I'm averaging this out across the nation, if you have a classroom of 30 kids, at least one is either undocumented or has undocumented family members. In a state like New York, that's going to be higher. Right? So you need to be sensitive to the fact that these kids are dealing with all kinds of psychological pressures related to that. Right? Um, that that's really going to make uh, their educational experience a lot more difficult. And, and this is just uh, one of the reports, uh, Shattered Families. There are a whole host of other ones and, and an, another one facing our future. Uh, if you're interested, I have a whole host of reports. I'd be happy to, uh, to email you. So in terms of immigrant rights groups, New York Immigration Coalition is one of the ones I work with, Northern Border Coalition I also work with, uh, no more deaths right on, on the border trying to, to deal with that issue, uh, United We, we Dream uh, working on, um, uh, on the DREAM Act uh, specifically. So in New York State, what advocates have accomplished? Uh, last year, Governor Comer suspended the state's participation in ESCOM, and that was huge. The state of Illinois was first, right? So you have like a handful of states who said, we are not going to collaborate with ICE if they racially profile, right? Our police is only allowed to ask people about their papers if it is in the context of a criminal investigation, right? New York, we're not going to be Arizona when it comes to this stuff, right? Of course, shortly after the, uh, the governor announced that, announcement came from Department of Homeland Security saying, you know what, we don't care if you guys want to opt out, no one can opt out. Everybody has to be in, right? So, so it's this power struggle going on. On a local level, uh, like on a county level, a town, city, we've had a lot of ordinances passed, again, directing local police to not collaborate with ICE unless it is really a, a, a legitimate, uh, you know, law enforcement uh, concern. In New York, we did pass our version of the DREAM Act, meaning undocumented immigrants can pay in-state tuition, right, which is a huge deal. In, 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 in most of the states, they have to pay out-of-state tuition, which basically closes the door to education to many of them. And right now, there is a state law uh, that was just introduced um, a few months ago, and that may be voted on as early as uh, next January in, in the next session, and that would also give um, a state uh, tuition assistance such as TAP uh, to undocumented immigrants, right? So we're going to take it a, a step further here. Uh, needless to say, you know, free law clinics, we continue to have them, uh, and most recently for DACA Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, what Deferred Action is, it quite simply puts a pause on your possibility of being deported, right? If you qualify, the government says, for the next two years, we're not going to deport you. That's all it does. It does not give you a green card. It does not give you access to legal status. But it does say, for two years, we're not going to deport you. Uh, and uh, if you qualify, you could get a work permit. Right? So uh, this could benefit uh, up to 2 million people. It just went into effect uh, August 15th. And that's what I was mentioning earlier on. Right? This is an executive action. And the president felt pressured by advocates to do this uh, and he did that because uh, Congress refused to, to work together with him on comprehensive immigration reform. So grassroots uh, uh, efforts, very, very important. In Chicago, uh, on, on the day it went into effect, 10,000 immigrants uh, showed up and, and got in line uh, for, for the workshop to see, to see if, if they could uh, process paperwork uh, and, and you know, kind of at, at, at least get some reprieve. Thousands of immigrants showed up in New York City, I mean, all across the country, right, especially in, in the main areas. So uh, the current situation is this. Uh, immigration debate is uh, extremely polarized, and it gets that way especially before elections, right? But it, it's, it's generally polarized. Anyhow, 
There's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, sadly, the deaths on the border continue to rise, even though the overall numbers of, of people coming across uh, is, is down right now. And, and very disturbingly, hate crimes are up as well. Right? You have a whole bunch of vigilante groups, especially down south. There's recently a report from uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, that chronicles uh, some of that. Uh, DACA is not enough, right? It's an executive action. Really what we need is comprehensive immigration reform. And I mean, the DREAM Act you know, goes part, part way as far as I'm concerned, but also does not go uh, far enough. So from, from my perspective, it is absolutely crucial that uh, you get informed, that you stay informed, and, and that you get involved. And again, for those of you who are uh, looking to become teachers, it's very important to be sensitive to that issue. Uh, because, you know, we do have a lot of undocumented people in this country. And it could be very easily fixed. From my perspective, the bottom line is we don't have enough visas. Okay, our visa caps are unrealistically low. This is a global problem. Globally, 200 million people are on the move and work in countries uh, other than the country of their birth. Right? So uh, to think that we can keep people out by building a wall, that's, that's just a, a ridiculous notion. Right? And, uh, but, but there are ways in which we could address the problem, and, and one can only hope that we're going to become more sensible <laughs> in the near future. Thanks. Thank you.